Good evening. Ready to go, James? All right. Let's get this evening going. Hi. Welcome. That's great. Well, I can tell this is going to be a great evening. Uh, some of the sessions that we have here, I encourage people to talk among themselves. And you're talking among yourselves. That's, that's a very good sign. And this is going to be an extraordinary evening. And if I had to choose a theme for it, and I have, it would be transitions. And not just the city in transition, not even just the topic of our choice tonight, talking about this choice we will be making around a new director of planning, but this is also a transition for the city program. Now, I've been at this for 10 years, and I could have retired a couple of years ago. But why would I? This has been a dream job. I'm amazed they pay me for it. Uh, and it has been remarkable to have built on the foundation that the first director, Judy Overlander, provided. A solid reputation, great programs that we've been able to build on. But circumstance and opportunity make this just the right time to begin the transition to a new director for the city program. And we've started that. Our Dean Pro Tem, Joanne Curry, and I have been talking with people in the community and among ourselves within Simon Fraser. And we realized this would be a great chance to build on the foundations that have been laid for the city program. And, and as we move towards the choice of a new director, uh, for me to take a step back and, and for this interim period to have, well, an acting director. And we've made that choice. So it's a, a remarkable pleasure, I have to say, to introduce you to an acting director that I'll be able to work with as we move the city program to a new level. So won't you join me in, in welcoming the new acting director for the city program, Andy Ann. That was a pretty warm round of applause, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, that also tells me that a lot of you know Andy, and I'm sure many of you do because, well, you read the newspapers or you listen to the media, and you know that the remarkable work that Andy has done as the chief researcher for Bing Tom and Associates, BTA Works. But, uh, and look, he's got a, a resume here that's longer than most of the speakers that we've had here at the city program. I'm not going to go into it. Andy will have that chance, and you'll get to know him. Uh, but as an urban planner and a, a guy from SFU, and UCLA, and his own firm, and, and many places that he's worked in North America and around the world. He just has a, a, a remarkable ability to bridge this needed gap between the technology and analysis and explaining it in a way that is meaningful to people. And, and we think the city program, in the time that he'll have, will be able to to immensely move forward just in that area, both as far as the public programs that we do and, and of course, opportunities like this. Andy, come on up. Thank you. Want to say anything? Well, hi. Um, I'm Andy Yan, and I'll be the acting director of the city program. But I think, first of all, I think the most... One of the key things I want to start out is this incredible beacon that Judy Oberlander and our Gordon Price has built in, in the last decade, in the last two decades, for being a beacon towards what good urbanism could be or should be. And I'd like to just give a round of applause to, to Gordon Price. And, and, Judy, and, of course, Judy Ober, and, of course, Judy Oberlander. Sure. <laughs> not yet, not yet. Haven't left yet. I'll give you, give you another chance to do that. Thanks so much. Thank you, Andy. Working forward, looking forward to working with you. Well, back to transitions. And what a remarkable panel we've got, as someone said, not very often. Well, in fact, never have we been able to bring together these past planners to discuss the city's future. 
And that's all I got to say. I'm not going to give you separate bios. Many of you already know these people. But the only thing you really need to know is that they have been leading this city as directors of planning now for half a century. That's a, a remarkable achievement by any stretch, a city like this, and, and really the continuity that they've provided. But we're going to get into that. So let's start right away. We're going to give them a chance to speak for about five minutes both on this question of what we should be looking for, uh, for a new director of planning, but, but more importantly, what should the city be looking for? What is the culture of planning that we aim for? That's really the question that we have before us. And then we choose a person to try and do that. So we're going to do this in reverse chronological order. We'll begin with Brent Totterin there on the far right, and McAfee, Larry, you guys reversed on me. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> they were co-directors of planning. And had, I, uh, I think you've been in the trenches uh, as, what was your role back then? I, housing planner. Housing planner. I remember that very well indeed. And of course, Ray Spaxman. So let's begin with Brent. Brent, tell us. We've got two things we're looking at here. What would we be looking for in a director of planning? Uh, what's the culture of planning? Well, I suspect all of us are, uh, may come at this question from different perspectives. And I think I might be the only past chief planner uh, who when I was hired was the subject of an event like this. I was tr t we, Ray and I were talking about whether there had been previous, when, when you two were appointed, whether there had been a conversation about what sort of planner you should have after Tom Fletcher. Um, and I remember following this conversation uh, from afar at the time while I was going through the hiring process and how impressed I was that there was what it said about Vancouver as a city that you could gather a crowd and even get media attention around the question of who the chief planner should be, what kind of person the chief planner should be. Not very many cities still in my experience would, would consider such a conversation important enough uh, to warrant uh, this kind of crowd on a night like this. Uh, and I was impressed back then. And, uh, but I'm going, to, I'm going to tackle this first part maybe a little differently, and I'm going to s say this in the context of some concern to, is I'm, I apologize if I'm raising your, your blood pressure right off the bat, but I've got, I've got concerns about uh, the moment that we're in that go well beyond this particular HR question of who the next chief planner should be. Because when I was hired, I remember feeling like the, the, the public felt that, boy, if we could just hire a, another good chief planner, everything will be all right. That was the kind of feeling that I was picking up. I don't feel that way anymore. Uh, I look at the context of Metro Vancouver as a region, and I see planning stripped out of TransLink for austerity purposes, as, as we've all bought into this narrative that we should cut, gut the... the, the the operating budget of TransLink, and now there's been two rounds of cuts where basically all the planners are gone from TransLink. I can no longer name who the, uh, the strong uh, vocal voice at the region is for planning, the sort of new Ken Cameron uh, at the regional level. I, I'm lucky enough to work across the region now, and I know that there are many chief planners across all the municipalities of the lower region who are doing very good work in very challenging circumstances with different political positioning. Uh, often doing work quietly because their councils would rather their chief planner be seen and not heard. But they're getting uh, good and, and creative work done. That gives me some hope. But uh, a lot of the, the city making and the region making that seems to be going on right now in the region is being done by provincial ministers, it seems, or, or by the premier. When you, when you look at impacts of issues like the transit referendum or decisions that are being made right now about the future of the ALR, that are fundamentally affecting the nature and f future of our region, not just our city. Uh, it, I think it's a legitimate question to ask about whether we still care about strong, smart planning in this region, whether it's still part of our identity, uh, certainly in the way that it felt like it was part of the identity when I first came here almost 10 years ago. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite nervous about that. And when then I think about the HR question at City Hall, I, I wonder, do they even want a chief planner who's going to be the kind of chief planner that we all aspired to be? Uh, principled, provocative, outspoken, not shy. None of us uh, on this panel are shy about uh, saying uh, what we feel needs to be said, speaking truth to power, so to speak. Uh, but I'm not sure that's what the powers that be at City Hall want anymore. And uh, if it doesn't matter um, um, how uh, impressive a position is on paper, 
If all the good planners out there read the situation and think, well, I can't be a passionate and outspoken city maker who, who, who is in, extremely passionate about the future of our region, if, if the political masters and such won't let me be that. I, I think it's, the jury's still out on, on what the new city hall will be. They're hiring not only a new chief planner, but a new city manager and several other leadership positions. So uh, if I were a, a planner now looking at this job in the way that I looked at it 10 years ago, I don't know what I would think about whether or not I would want to come and whether or not uh, this is a good moment to be a chief planner in Vancouver right now. So all of those, and I, I, I'm, a, I'm an inherently optimistic person, so I don't say any of that to depress you. I say it because it's a challenge for all of us to, to, to think that this isn't just a matter of, boy, we just need to hire the right person this time again. I think we need to look fundamentally at the nature of the kinds of messages we're sending uh, as, a, as a city and as a region about whether planning and design still matter. Uh, just, uh, when I first started the job in 2007, I was speaking uh, at an event in another city, and at the end of it, in the Q&A, someone put up their hand, and, and the first question they asked was, how do we get a planner like you in our city? And I don't think they meant because I was particularly intelligent or had said anything, but I was passionate. I cared, and I was talking about the city. And my response to them was, well, if you need to ask yourself and the city needs to ask itself, do they want a planner like me? Because many city halls out there want their planners to be quiet, want their planners to go along with the political will, to play the game of credit and blame uh, instead of being politically independent. And I think our Vancouver City Hall has to ask, has to ask themselves that question now, what kind of planner do we want? <laughs> well, I'm asking the question, which is somewhat like Brent, do all good things need to come to an end? Now, I'm not negative, and my answer actually is no, they don't need to come to an end. Gord asked us to talk a bit about vision and how that linked to the new, and that's vision with a small b, <laughs> and how that linked to the new planning director, or should I say general manager of planning and development services, quite a different thing. Just for a moment of background, if you all recall, and most of you will recall, in, what was it, 1976, the first World Urban Forum was here. And I remember people saying, hmm, oh, Vancouver, a kind of unspectacular city in a spectacular setting. Now, 30 years later, in 2006, the World Urban Forum was back here, and people were holding Vancouver up as a showcase for new types of urban innovation. A vibrant inner city with families, financing growth, public engagement, and the question then was, came up, actually, at that, just after that time, what else is there to do? Well, there's a lot of outstanding initiatives. Certainly, we had city plan, and while I think a lot of the directions are still relevant, the community identified 19 neighborhood centers, and the whole process has stalled. Only two centers actually went through rezoning, and I'm not sure that any are now underway. While we are internationally recognized for public engagement, I've had visitors come recently and say, but this looks like same old, same old, what people did elsewhere. The planners do the plans and the public responds and say, where did this plan come from? And there's the question of research, which is seldom raised because most of these folks are more interested in doing and designing than researching. My side was more the research side. But I think it's often forgotten that most of the policies we came up with had a very good intellectual foundation. You think about housing families at high density, which brought children into the downtown. That wasn't just haphazard, a lot of research including people like Penny going out and interviewing people who were living in family housing at the time, what works and what doesn't. It stood the test of time. 
When we did DCLs and CACs, we had to balance community needs with market viability. A lot of fiscal impact analysis happened. I don't see a lot of that happening now. And I'm hoping that when a new planner comes in, and with a new government who may restore the long form census, that <laughs> indeed there will be some analysis of the kind of needs that are happening in the city as so many of the baby boomers age and more people come to the community and resources continue to be very tight. So I think there's a lot of work to be done to set sort of new directions, new ways of doing things. I'd like to also comment on this new position or the position that's being advertised. It's a general manager for planning and development services. Now, this is quite different from what Larry and I were. We weren't a general manager. General manager means that you sit at the corporate management table. Now, that sounds pretty good. Excepting I sat there covering for Jackie Forbes Roberts for six months. And the amount of time spent worrying about the latest service improvement fad and next year's budget cuts meant that planning didn't get done. So I'm concerned about the general manager having time taken away from planning. Then there's the question of development services. We were lucky that the building, chief building official, the building department, a lot of development services actually happened in other departments. Now, and I believe that there's about 300 people in the planning department, about double what we had. And the amount of management it takes for a larger and a more diverse set of responsibilities. And that brings us to planning, and I would echo what Brent said, but I would notice that while we were in the planning department, the really interesting council priorities were by and large being led by planning or planning as co-managing with engineering or finance. Today, those exciting projects, what I call the fun projects, are being managed out of the city manager's office. Housing, housing projects, the Green City Initiative, a lot of the intergovernment relations, where planning might have written in the past things like the New Deal for Cities document for Vancouver. Now that's all happening in the city manager's office. So there is a question about what the planning department has left on its plate that council's interested in. Now, I've been listening to some of the previous discussions around this topic, and there's a lot of interest in a new city plan or some new initiative around that notion. For those calling for a new plan, let me finish with my experience. When in the late 1980s, the planning department thought we needed a new plan, and council had no interest in it at all, we tabled the Vancouver plan and it still sits on a shelf. A few years later, when council was coping with NIMBY and they wanted to hear from the community, suddenly planning ramped up. And over a few years, some 100,000 people under the inspiration of council and with planning managing the process, started talking about the future of Vancouver. Now, you may be calling for a new plan, but if that's not council's priority, I would suggest the challenges to look at uh, how you adjust council priorities and not bash the director of planning for not delivering. I would say timing is everything. And if council's willing to tackle some of these issues, then let's hope the new planner is there and ready to roll. But I think most importantly, let's hope that all of those new initiatives aren't short-term projects in the city manager's office and are really part of a broader ongoing city initiative. So I don't think good things need to end, but I certainly think the new planner needs to learn 
about Vancouver and some of the directions, some that work, some that need to be changed. Listen, particularly to the community who's very knowledgeable, and then lead in some of the new directions that will try and make sure Vancouver stays one of the most livable and sustainable cities in the world. Thanks, Anne. Larry, the other co-director. Well, I'd like to uh, start by noticing that there were two other events before this event, and I was very happy to see those events because those were events that involved young people, that involved the public, to start talking about the planning issues of the day. And if you haven't seen some of the material that came out of there, I commend you to go on whatever website you do go on and to look at that because I think it should be uh, in informative for anyone that has to uh, deal with the questions that we're dealing with tonight because it's uh, advice that comes from people who are really the, uh, the recipients of the services uh, of planning. I'm a little different than my colleagues who have spoken before. I believe profoundly that the planning that a city does is determined in large measure by the audacity and the aggressiveness and the intelligence of the planners who do the planning. One thing about being a has-been in one city is you make your living in every other city. <laughs> and I can tell you there are innovative, amazing, aggressive planners at work in cities all over the world. People who started when the planning was at a bottom ebb, a terrible ebb. Uh, in Auckland, New Zealand, an extraordinary planning team at work. In Toronto, Jen Kismet, who went from a time where really planning was just right on the edge of things and has brought that back to the center. And so I believe that the chief planner, but also the entire planning organization, because no planner does this job. It's done by hundreds of smart, intelligent people. Rhonda Howard's in this audience. Rhonda Howard should be the director of planning. <laughs> Because she was the director of planning on many issues that we dealt with. Because we worked as, a, as a, a team of intelligent people. But what the leader has to be is a person that inspires. A person that goes out and fights for that planning. A person who establishes it, that it's necessary. Not wait for some politician to tell you they want it. They're never going to tell you they want it. You have, to have, you have to go and convince them it's the right thing. And so for me, of all the things that could happen, you could be a good administrator and all that. I'm not, I don't care about that. I expect that. But I want a planner in this town who has a vision for this place, that has a vision for great cities, that knows what good cities are about, that knows when it doesn't work, and that will push that forward and will inspire all of those planners in that organization that she or he runs and leads to do the best possible work they can do. We haven't, in my opinion, had proactive planning in this city in the last few years. We are still dealing with plans that are obsolete. And every single day, they become more obsolete. The reason we have affordability problems is that we are 10 years behind planning the city to address the need of the supply of housing, among other things, and the new methods that we need to bring to affordable housing. These are things that are not being done in the city, and they need to be done, and they will be done by an innovative, forward-thinking, visionary planner. So for me, that's the first important thing that has to happen. Second, that planner has to be a great communicator. That planner has to be a person that when they stand up, you stop talking and listen, not because someone told you to, but because you want to, because you believe in what that person's going to say, because you know you're going to learn something from what that person says, and you know that person's going to shut their mouth and listen to you as well. And I want a planner who's a good communicator. And finally, I want that planner to have a hell of a lot of passion in what they believe in. So they don't stand up for it when a politician starts uh, saying, well, we don't do this or we don't do that. In fact, they stand up and say, you need to do something. And they build a huge constituency of thousands of people behind them to do whatever needs to be done so that when they walk up to council and talk, they know, the council knows they're speaking for hundreds or tens of thousands of people. The second is you have to remember 
that this planner in this organization is also leading one of the most transactional development management processes in the world today. We, we decide what people can do according to a negotiation, a discussion. And you know what? It's proven to be one of the most effective systems in the world. Except that, in the last few years, we've forgotten how to use it. We don't take advantage of the benefits of it. People have forgotten the basic intentions of it. So the planner has to be a great negotiator. They have to be a great political actor. They have to be a person that has a natural gravitas that brings with it a sense of truth in what they're saying and a sense of pulling people together and getting things done and being able to negotiate with those powerful people out there that would prefer to control the city rather than have you control the city or the planners who represent you control the city. So those are things that, bottom line for me, have to come back to the planner in this town. You can't have a planner in this town when no one knows who the hell the person is. You can't have a planner in this town when someone writes in the newspaper, well, you know, Vancouver's not as good as Toronto and the people are not as smart as Toronto. You've got to have a planner in this town who believes in this town, who believes in these people. And then it brings me then to the planning culture that that planner has to sponsor with all their colleagues. You know, I now know, and I can tell you from my experience all over the world, we have a great planning culture. We have a great technical skills. We have great insights. We have great principles. But what we have lost in the last few years is demolishing all of that. We have forgot about how to talk to our citizens. We don't know how to do public engagement anymore. I, it frightens me. When I'm invited as an old has-been codger from the past over to a neighborhood because no one in the planning department or the director of planning will come and talk to them. No one will tell them what it, what, how the process might work. No one will listen to them. And then you have processes where everything happens and everyone dance, dances around and then the planners decide to do something else. We have to bring back a commitment to real public engagement in the planning of this city, and we have to let the city be the result of that public engagement, not just a little bit of window dressing on the side, which I think it has become. And if, in fact, you, we can bring back that involvement and all those tens of thousands of citizens into this discussion about the city of the future, you can have faith that it will be a great city. And then your planner becomes the agent for that. And that's what I'm looking for in the next regime of planning here in Vancouver. Thank you. Ray Spaxman. Well, the old codger on my right, as he announced himself, is uh, quite young, actually. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Ray's our father. <laughs> <laughs> we all started under him. So that's, that's actually fascinating because when you're the fourth, one, two, yeah, I still count, the fourth speaker, all the stuff that you thought you might want to say is perhaps not as relevant as you thought it might be because what they've raised your ire, I can tell from the level of support. Enthusiasm of, well, half your faces anyway, that you're enjoying this debate that's starting here and will eventually go out to you and you can enjoy it and tell us where we've gone wrong. One fascinating thing is that if this represents from um, 1973 through to 19, 2012. 2012, it's interesting to see the different characters sitting here who all played a part as a director of planning. And we're all so different, and we were all relatively successful, made lots of mistakes, and screwed up, and were human. And one of the things about the new director of planning, you're going to be he or she, is it's going to be human, and if, if she or he is human, she's going to have a difficult time of raising to the standard of a man on a charger with a flag driving everybody in that direction. So there's a subtlety about that relationship that that human being has to have, recognizing their own strengths and their own weaknesses, and gathering around them the experts. And the experts are interesting, because most of the experts in the city are the people who live in the city, an experience. Uh, when I was an area planner in Toronto, I learned very quickly 
that it was the little old ladies, as we call them in Brunnitude, I guess, who came into the office, who had the wisdom about how that place worked. Not the incoming planner from, in my case, from England, with a strange accent, trying to tell them how to do planning. And that was a great learning period of time, when I first formed the thought that it was the people that mattered. And every organization and every part of any organization that denies that is harming the place. And I agree with some of my speakers that that's been harmed in recent years, and it's, it's prevailing the whole of every government. Perhaps the latest election gives hope that there's enough people that won't stand for it. So you've got to open your window and shout out that you've had enough. There's more and more people who do that will then perhaps be able to control who's going to make this decision. How are they going to make the decision? Is it going to be a popular decision? Is it a decision that can take? Who is the next director planning? And the next director planning, um, if he comes in too strong, or she comes in too strong, with this council, um, there could be some difficulty because you know who leads planning at the present time. Now, unfortunately for us, the Vision Council has some very good principles, you know, the sustainability of the green city, the ways of doing so, are so important. They need to be supported and encouraged, or just supported if you're the servant there, in what they're doing, but they need to be guided. Somehow, um, delicately, <coughs> carefully, we have to deal with them with as much as respect as we have for all you people. We have to deal with them with the same respect as you have to deal with them with the same respect. So that same respect means kindness and love. <laughs> and one big element is truth. <clears throat> and truth is a major element of this. If the next director of planning doesn't want to tell the truth, or is afraid to tell the truth, they are no use to us. So even if they last six months and have told the truth, they will have a better impact than somebody who lasts, like I did, 15 years. Now, was I not telling the truth? <laughs> <laughs> or was it more subtle than that? There was something subtle going on, because I was accused all the time of being extremely naive. Very, very naive guy. I'm still naive, as you can tell. But the, the interesting thing is that, so it's truth and love and care. And how do you interview people for that? You can interview them about what your urban design skills are, uh, do you know about homelessness, uh, what's happening in the rest of the world, um, we want them to have that, if they're going to be at the planning, first of all, they're going to have to have a planning degree. And they're not easily earned these days, and most educational systems, Penny, are pretty good in bringing people the idea that ethics is important as well as statistics. And so how you get that balance is what we hope a wise council will look for. Now, council, fortunately, doesn't just have to make a director of planning. They have to make a city manager too, because they fired the city manager, or they said they did, or somebody said they did. And anyway, the city manager's gone, the director of planning is gone, and they have an opportunity now to do something very profound, and that is bring a planner in who's a planner. Now, there's a whole lot of discussion here about management. I should probably leave management to another session, but I also like that one that Covey says, that the important thing uh, when you're in a position like this, is to lean the ladder on the right, right, right wall. That's leadership. The person who gets you to the top of the ladder and then describes and finds that it's not the right place may be a good manager. Pick the leader in this. And that leader has to have the combination of leadership skills, human skills, communication skills, and an ability to handle a council, which is very tricky business, but is changing. I think. Uh, federal, provincial, regional, city, uh, politi political systems are changing. The people have had enough, they're feeling it. I think the last election proves there's a, a wind of change, and we can catch that wind, and maybe this council has enough subtlety about its understanding of human beings and what goes on to recognize they need to shift in order to represent the population properly. I'm also conscious that I've sat in this audience many times, and I've got to tell you, I get very uneasy when one person, two person, three person, four person have gone on with their own opinion uh, for at least five minutes each. And I'm thinking, that's enough, that's really, I'm glad I came, I've enjoyed it. Can, can we have our turn, please? And if we believe what I believe, that 
there's a lot of people in here with a lot of empathy for what we're saying collectively. Although, if, if we had the debate, you'd find a lot of disagreement here this evening. And one of the things I enjoyed so much about being the director was my staff disagreed. They disagreed with me, and we had debates about that. And they uh, tackled me on the fact that I was wrong. And that was enjoyable, because it meant, as they say, you know, if three, <laughs> if three people agree, uh, you don't need to have a discussion. So when, you, when you've had disagreement or you have another point of view, then it's good to have it. So I haven't said what's in here yet, and uh, Gordon's saying that I can't go on for another half an hour, and so I'm going to stop now and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Good work. Good work. Thank you, sir. <laughs> but you can get away with it. You don't work at City Hall. I, what I heard was that you were saying that in order to get the kind of planet that we need, the political culture, the council that runs this place has to change its culture. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it, it has to, I, it has I to understand I better. I actually don't, don't agree. No. Okay. No. 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 Um, what I've been trying to say is that the planner is the sponsor of a way of looking at the world. The planner is an agent to tell people, to show people, to illustrate through example that you can build a city in a different way, in a better way, to offer a different thing than people start with. I have to tell you that all over North America, I see planners who are, they're modest, they're they never want to be seen in public. They never want to tell the story. They never want to do anything that's, you know, that would endanger them. And that's why I keep saying that courage is a really big part of this thing. And you, if you take the, take the experience recently, of, I'll go back to Jennifer Kismet, the new director of planning in Toronto. Her council doesn't agree with her on a lot of things. Her council would rather her that she's not doing her job. But she keeps doing it. She keeps building constituency for it. She keeps building political interest in it. She finds her alliances. And slowly, she's bringing planning back from a very low level in Toronto, one of the lowest in this country, to being a meaningful guiding force for that city. And to me, that's what the planner does. You know, it's pretty easy if everything's good and you come in and, you know, everyone's happy and the politicians love you and all that. Well, that's, that's the easy planning. The harder planning is to go to a place where people maybe don't get that yet. And you can start to show that through the quality of what you have to say and what, how, whether you can be convincing or not. And I think we need much more strength and courage in our planners than we've seen recently. Uh, Brent? Ray? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I think I'm the only one here who actually has worked uh, directly with and for the, the Vision Council. And what I'll say is that the, the problem statement was that, in my observation when they came in, they had heard the narrative that said, uh, you have a lot of good ideas, staff is going to try to keep the, the, you from achieving them. Uh, that was the shtick, that was the narrative that existed at City Hall, that Judy Rogers somehow kept council from doing what it wanted to do. And I think the new Vision Council, I'm being really candid with you here, I think the new Vision Council heard that and said, well, that's not how it's going to be with us. Uh, and I, look, I greatly lament that because, as, as Ray said, um, when they came in, the vast majority of what they were saying, we planners were downright excited about. Uh, there were a lot of things that were, were exactly in keeping with kind of our own perspectives on city making. But immediately, something was obviously different in how you do things. And it was a sort of a, if you're not with us all the time, 100% uh, of the time, uh, you're against us. And so uh, if you even disagreed once or twice in a, in, a, in a series of 10 conversations, that could come back to haunt you. Now, as I, I would frequently go to my former, uh, uh, my predecessors and ask for advice on how to deal with them, and they were all very helpful. And as Larry said, that doesn't stop you from saying the right thing. You still say it. You still do it. You still act on principle, and you, and you, and you do your job. Speak truth to power, and you never... Uh, are so afraid to keep your job that you don't do your job. But I, I don't really think it was a problem of the culture of the politicians, because everything I've just described was lamentable. 
because we were actually on their side, but they didn't necessarily always see it that way. The real problem is when I'm going to be candid again, when they hired a city manager who was the real uh, author of an entirely different culture at City Hall. And it was the city manager that created a culture of don't uh, disagree or else you will pay the price. Keep your head down. There's only one smart person in the room and it's not you. <laughs> Uh, and that culture, it was the culture from the city manager's office that was the real problem. Okay. Now, you can say that Vision hired her, but I still think that that's the root of it. So that's why I'm optimistic, because that city manager is gone. And uh, there is an opportunity now for this Vision Council, who's been in place for a fair while, to realize that staff are really on their side. And nobody's trying to keep them from uh, being the political leaders they want to be. But we're a team. Okay. Staff and council are a team. Right. Yeah, I don't, uh, uh, politicians are people too, and uh, they have the frailties and the necessity to get on with their work, and they're nice people mostly. I mean, who else would volunteer to stand to do a, a difficult job like that and then carry on as they do? So I have a lot of wish to help the politicians. You may not think that from some of my writing, uh, but I'm critical. But nevertheless, they had a difficulty when they appointed Penny, and that was... Um, Olympic Village and other things were in real crisis form and they needed a strong manager and uh, the mayor had uh, recognized the strength of the previous deputy minister to get things done and that was brought in and Penny did that and some people believe that was a bit of a miracle, I don't know for sure, and did the job but then she waved her fingers at everybody because she was the only one who knew anything right. And I've been to several meetings, which Brent's been at when I've been at meetings where there's three of me and the rest are three people from downtown east side. And I don't think it's just telling secrets. And she and I would be having a row. Brent would try to find a midway. He'd be told to shut up because it wasn't council's policy. And so that, what that did is denigrate the whole of the staff. That had gone. Maybe uh, Vision knows that now. They know that they have to reach back to all us people in the city and do a better job. And the opportunity to get the manager and the director planning at the same time is a wonderful opportunity for that to be remedied. It won't hurt their policy direction. It'll help their policy direction because more and more people get behind it and be able to refine it. Just like, and I see Marguerite sitting there, just like Team knew in, way back in 1972. One of the things that I keep wondering about as I go around and I listen, I've tried to stay out of things because I've been mostly working elsewhere in the world. And as I go to the odd thing in Vancouver, I sense this sort of something's wrong and that somehow the public and the council are on totally different wavelengths. Now, the strange thing is when I look at the sort of 10 or so directions that teams set back in the 1970s, this council is still moving in those directions. They're worried about affordable housing. They're concerned that um, the city be not only sustainable, but as the new knowledge has come, greener. They're trying to ensure that this is a walking, biking, transit city. They're making sure that growth pays its way for new community services. These aren't new directions. They're really directions that have come over many years. But what seems to be the case is that I don't think council realizes that they're not new directions, that they're really building on the past. They're sort of institutional amnesia and that might be, as an aside, because while well, we sort of alluded to the staff that were around us, we never really said much about it. And I brought two exhibits here for you, which you can't see, but we'll put in the material. <laughs> One is under Ray's direction, there were a number of bright young planners. Now, by the time if you don't recognize them. That's Rhonda. There's Rhonda. <laughs> there's Trish French. There's Larry. There's me. There's Roy. <laughs> you with brown hair. 
Now, the interesting thing is that Larry and I, when we had to put a management team together, this was our management team. We'd all been around since the 1970s. We all had a good understanding of the directions of the city. But within a year or two, and we'll add this as Exhibit B under you know, the materials from this workshop, within a couple of years, mostly because a lot of us age, but also some people found more creative or interesting different jobs, the vast majority of people, I counted somewhere around 60, of the people who had written the policies and plans over the previous 30 years, I mean, I see some of here, Frank's here, many people, had left the city. So the irony is that while you've had a council that has been following directions that have been around for 30, 40 years, almost half a century, the people who might be able to help and explain to the council and build on that left the city. So I could see the challenges that Brent faced as many people left. But that doesn't mean there aren't new, young, capable people and a very educated population in Vancouver who I sense are all willing to engage and help. And hopefully there'll be a more open um, door at City Hall for that. And some of those policies can be continued but improved with everybody engaged in them. But we did have a loss, and I think that that's been part of the challenge that the more recent planning directors have had to cope with. I just wanted to say that I, I'm afraid I think it's a little too simple to say that the, the issue that we have with planning right now has to do with the city manager or the nature of that city manager. I might have things to say about that city manager or I might not, but I don't, th I don't think it's that simple. I think it has to do with a combination of things. But what I'm trying to say for this particular topic is one of the things it has to do with is the strength of the person who is leading the planning service and plan planning efforts of the city. Whether that person really commands around them hundreds of hundreds of people and other people to building a real movement that, that really any politician would have to respond to. And also whether that person is courageous. I learned something from Ray, which I tried to carry on, and I know Anne tried to carry on, and Britt carried on too. And that was, you have to be courageous. You can't just, when someone says, uh, 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 you can't just shut up. You have to still say what you think is right. And when they don't want you, they don't want you. I always told, I tell everyone that when I took on this job, and Anne knows this because she did about the same thing, we organized our personal lives so that we could be fired at any point without kind of collapsing in economic disaster. <laughs> Otherwise, we belong to them. And we didn't want to belong to them. I learned that from Ray. I watched him come convene us all years and years ago and say, I want you to know I'm probably going to be fired tomorrow morning. You did that at least three times in my memory. <laughs> <laughs> and he never got fired. <laughs> He, like, he retired with honor. And it's because when you are a planning leader that says things that are compelling, when you're a planning leader that says things that people believe in, when you're a planning leader that listens carefully so your voice is the voice of a bunch of people that you've heard and learned from, you become a very compelling force in a democratic political process. And that's what I feel we need to get back to, and I think we've lost. And I didn't, haven't seen that in recent times. I, I'm not laying blame on anyone. I just haven't seen it. I can tell you there are a lot of other councils and a lot of other places where I'm doing work right now that are a lot less sympathetic to planners than the planning uh, the, and, the, and the council of this city. And not only do, do the council of this city have many of the things that I think many of us believe in, but they have been, you know, pretty positive about planning and about planning activity as compared to the struggle that I know goes on in, by planners in other places. And it's important that we not forget that these are just not institutions and positions. These are people. And if the people are really good at what they do, you have success. And if they're not very good at what they do, you don't have success. You've been remarkable in 
articulating the clear need for the character of the kind of person. But what about the community itself? I think all of you, with maybe the exception of Brent, dealt with a city that had to accommodate growth, but never had to come to terms with changing the character or scale of the established neighborhoods, except on the margin. We had the mega projects because we had the industrial land. We had a neighborhood process, city plan, it's true. But look how, as you've already acknowledged, how little it was implemented. When you come up, and I learned this in politics, no one ever goes into a neighborhood and says, hi, we're here to change the character of your community. How would you like us to do that? <laughs> is the character of the community now such, with the flow of wealth that has come into this, with the desire of people to keep the character in the face of forces of gentrification, more than ever are reluctant to see a change in character or scale. And in fact, if a council can't look to planners to do that, are they not then entitled to find another way? I think there are ways of doing that. And I look at some of the recent plans, Marple, West End, Grandview Woodlands, which is still going through a planning process, which didn't work. But I look back to Knight and Kingsway, King Edward Village area. That's not on the top of all your minds for neighborhood change because it wasn't a fight in the neighborhood. The community sat down with architects, developers. They looked at their own needs and how they were aging and changing. They looked at the services they wanted, new libraries, a grocery store, a variety of different community services. And they worked together to say, if we have change, how are we going to make that benefit the community? And I still remember one February night when there was a public hearing. I don't know whether you had left council at that time or not, Gord. And we came with the plan, the community came with the plan for Knight and Kingsway. No, it, was, uh, yes. it was after you. Yes. And 80 people showed up. <clears throat> and we said, holy shit. I mean, that's a significant planning term. <laughs> uh, technical term. Technical term. What did we do wrong? We thought the community supported this. Well, the mayor said, you know, anyone want to speak? And two people got up and spoke, and they spoke in favor of the plan. And then, anyone want to speak? Anyone want to speak? Anyone else want to speak? Council approved the plan. And immediately at that moment, the 80 people jumped up, they started throwing confetti and balloons and cheering the fact that their plan got approved. Now, go drive past Knight and Kingsway and look at the scale of that development and realize that 1,500 single family, single family in quotation mark, homes in that neighborhood were actually also rezoned to a variety of infill forms. The community can work for itself to see change. And they got out of it a new library, a new grocery store, some new parks, and um, community center improvements. So I think it can work. It's just the way it's done. Well, I, I, I'll extend what Anne is saying. I found something that served me pretty well in almost any setting. And I, too, started, as you know, as a neighborhood planner. And, and I found that, that if I go and talk to any group of people in this city, and I really find a way to put the real issues on the table, and I find a way to let them cope with those issues and learn about it and learn what the possibilities were and what the implications were, I got good results. I found a kind of a wisdom in that, that collective wisdom that's always served me well. We think we're coping with a lot of change, but you know what? You gotta look at Bogota, or you gotta look at Curitiba, and their leaders, who were faced with people who were afraid as well as angry, were found a way to reach out to those people and say, together, let's figure out how to cope. Because you know what? We can't go anywhere else. This is our home. This is the only thing we have. It's very little, but it is the only thing. And that means a kind of a collaboration, a partnership uh, with the people of your city. 
I still think that works. Yeah, I, said, I, I think it works, and, and, and I have no evidence here that it doesn't work. But what I think doesn't work is when you go out and talk to people, and then you develop, they all develop a plan, and it goes back to City Hall, and someone at City Hall says, no, nope, it's not good enough. Yeah, rewrite it. And we'll just do whatever we want to. Then people feel upset, angry. They feel abused. Is it possible to get a comprehensive, complete city plan, that is what's been called for by many, uh, that will deal with change on the scale that's required to accommodate the next several hundred thousand? One city plan through a single process? Can I, can I start up? Because I, I, I'm conscious, too, that this director of planning is going to have to get on well with the region. And that's because primary, in, in primary impact on this city is going to come at a much higher level than the city's concerns. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get in harmony with the metro planning organization, and if that doesn't get itself organized too, we shall be facing disasters from globalization, economic, environmental, and social changes that are far bigger than just homelessness or just converting the residential area. And we have to enjoin that discussion at that level with the whole community. Because unless the whole community can get involved with the issues that we are facing, like we read the newspaper and they tell us we're going to have another million, f for sure, in 30 years. And another, th another a million after that, a million after that, a million after that. And you know where that goes to. It can't go. It's already at 7 billion in the world beyond our capacity to equally share the benefits of what nature provides. And it's going to get worse, it's serious, and so the next director planning and the plan for the city has to be done very much in conjunction with at least the region and hopefully the province and hopefully the feds. Other examples in other communities show that the federal governments often are much more involved right. in what's happening in their cities. But do you think it is possible to extrapolate that million down to the neighborhood level in a single process to produce a comprehensive plan that can accommodate that growth in the time frame that you're talking about. Yes. I think yes, and I think Correct. what you're talking about in a short time frame is a land use plan. A comprehensive plan has to also include services, tough choices around money and funding, and it has to include We need we need to have a bigger yep. debate on this, yep. I think, because well, let me we have the debate work right it out. I don't hear any of you putting forward a process that suggests there will actually be tough decisions. What I hear you saying is that you work in conjunction with the community through a process that listens and accommodates. You will get the result that everyone will be satisfied with. I can tell you as a politician, X, I don't believe that. Well, I put up my hand a couple of times. Um, <laughs> your, your, your introductory statement certainly wasn't true in my case. Um, yeah. The narrative when I was hired was the downtown is basically done, which I found a hilarious statement since I spent a fair amount of my time still working in the downtown. But that the rest, that the, it was the challenge of the rest of the city because the quote unquote easy parts were done was the narrative when I was hired, whether it's true or not. Uh, two months before I was hired, the mayor uh, at the World Urban Forum announced this word eco-density with no <laughs> sense of what it meant. And my first task was to figure out what it meant um, and turn it into something workable. And, uh, and he wanted it uh, done in four months, which means no time for public engagement. Now, we ended up taking two years on it. And I think it was, ended up being a better conversation uh, than, than many people still give it credit for. But we spent most of our time digging ourselves out from the problems that, of how it was la la launched. And the sort of feeling, which to a certain extent was true, that the mayor who launched it really thought towers were the bee's knees and should exist just about everywhere. So how do you have a conversation about change in the rest of the city when, the, when it's the, the narrative was the fear of the Manhattanization of the neighborhoods uh, and the so-called suburbs of Vancouver? So at the end of it, we ended up developing words like gentle density and hidden density, laneway housing, all these kinds of things to talk about how, you, how neighborhoods can change but not fundamentally uh, eradicate their existing character in a reasonably healthy way. But my observation, even once having that high-level discussion, is that the existing plans, and, and with respect to the people who worked on them, didn't provide any clarity on how the rest of the city would change. We actually did an, a, a, 
uh, an exercise where we looked at what all the community visions enabled, and we tried to map it. And it was a it was a patchwork quilt of confusion. And I found when I was I'll loan you my map of it. <laughs> well, well I, we probably still have it. And that was the starting point uh, for our conversation of do we need a new plan? If for no other reason to provide clarity to everyone, including the neighborhoods, about what was possible now and what might happen in the future. I'm one of the people with the Vancouver Planning Commission who first championed the idea of a new plan. If you asked me now, I would say the city should absolutely not start a new plan because we don't have the moral authority as a planning department. We don't have the positioning with the communities and credibility. Uh, it would be a bloodbath. It would be a disaster. Uh, but I do believe a new plan is necessary, maybe once uh, credibility is being reestablished, both in terms of the principled approach to how design and growth can occur and how uh, community engagement really should be done. At that point, a new plan, I think, would be extremely valuable. But timing is everything, and I don't believe you could do it now. This is a great segue to go to, I think, to the audience. Yeah. After I <laughs> oh. <laughs> explain but has it's just right. come before this. Uh, I neglected to do this at the beginning. My apologies to the Planning Commission. I promised I would, and I'm going to do it now. This has actually been part of a three-part process that has been the result of a collaboration between us, the City Program, the Vancouver Planning Commission, the School of Community and Regional Planning. Dare I miss anybody? Oh, uh, City Conversation. Can't miss that. And. Given this process, the 60 people who came together with many backgrounds and experience, the city conversation that brought Marguerite Ford and Peter Ladner to talk on this, this is going to continue. But tonight we want to engage you. You've heard from the past planners. Now is an opportunity for you to ask your questions but also to make your comments because we're going to be keeping track of this. This is part of an ongoing process. And I'd like to begin actually by asking uh, Penny Gerstein of the School of Community and Regional Planning, whether in fact she has a question to lead us off with. Please do go to the mic and I'll ask all of you to do that. Uh, I know you'll be able to get in any other comments you want to make in response to, I'm sure, the questions that will come forward. Right. So, Penny. So, yeah. so thank you. Um, I, while I was listening, I was wondering whether we could clone all of you together and maybe we'd make a, <laughs> it would make a really good uh, new uh, head of planning, <laughs> in whatever we call that. Um, what I, in, as a segue into what uh, Gordon was talking about, I just wanted to preface what I'm going to ask. Um, we in the uh, in October 13th, we had we we brought together uh, a group of people. Um, many of you are actually in this room today, and uh, students uh, from the School of Community and Regional Planning at UBC um, to sort of do a. Uh, a kind of a, a think tank on on what is our principles and and values that have that are guiding us um, and we came up with a number of them which are going to be on the Vancouver City uh, uh, Planning Commission website and also in Scarb's website um, and um, but you know what what came from that was really a sense of um, you know that that there was these strong sort of of, of things that really did guide us. Um, and I think a lot of the people in the room were telling us stories of what happened in terms of the planning processes that kind of really developed those principles. And so what I would like to ask you is, you know, what are, you know, each, you know, if you were um, given the opportunity to actually uh, ask uh, of the, uh, you know, if you're given the opportunity to, um, you know, uh, to to provide uh, kind of guidance to whoever is selected uh, by telling them what you really feel are our sort of uh, uh, values are you know what what are the values that have sort of really guided Vancouver in in terms of your perspective and how that would affect um, them as uh, in their new role. Now that would be worthy of an hour's worth of discussion. So let me, if I can, uh, Penny, just say what would be the first piece of advice with respect to what Penny has asked that you would give? Let's say to the mayor. I wouldn't answer the question because I think that's the point. I, I would ask the citizens of Vancouver the question. You see, we haven't really asked the citizens of Vancouver in living memory the question. We've sort of assumed things. 
And we, we had a process. We had an extraordinary process at City Plan. You cannot forget about this process. It involved tens of thousands of people. It asked all kind of questions. It was not confusing. It was very clear. And it went to people who have never been involved in planning before. But how long ago was that? 20 years. It was 20 years ago. We've got, and look at all the people in this room. They're coming to see a bunch of has-beens. Why? Because people in this town, I think, want to talk about this town. They want to talk about their values. And I would say the first thing we have to do to tell that planner is to go out and meet the Vancouverites and ask the Vancouverites, what are those values? That's what I would say. And I wouldn't try to, to, to take the place of that, really, to be honest. One word, listen. And maybe two words, learn. And then lead. <laughs> Any more? No. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure this is the most important thing, but it's the thing that I want to say at this particular moment. I would say to not just the has-beens up here, but the has-beens in the room, in, in, in the audience, um, we have to crush this narrative that's been started recently that um, the ex-planners should shut up. There's been a narrative that said that started in that some some smart, young, passionate planners uh, from my former staff have even said it to me, and I said, "What are you saying?" This no, the, the the phrase is, uh, "We eat our young." In Vancouver, has been brought up. It, in other words, the past planners are critical of some things the new planners are doing, and uh, our current chief planner, at least for another week, has said that this is a real problem. Uh, I had this challenge when I was at City Hall. I used to joke that I couldn't swing a stick without hitting a former director of planning or a chief planner with a strong opinion on everything I was doing. But I had tremendous, res I started with the, the, the perspective of tremendous respect for the work that the people before me had done. And I had the benefit of some people like Rhonda and Trish and, and Rob Jenkins and such who were part of passing that forward to me. So this narrative that uh, the ex-planner should shut up, I, I've got a real concern about. I appreciate uh, that past generations still cared so much about this city that they were still highly engaged and, and uh, sometimes got upset about things that moved too far away from principles or what have you. So I would say to the mayor, to the chief planner, you might not always agree. I've disagreed with the people on this panel at times. Uh, but I always started with a strong position of appreciating them still being actively engaged, that I could learn from them. It was a tremendous benefit to me. So, okay, guys. So keep eating your young, if that's the phrase. Speed it up, because yeah. we've got a lot of people out yeah, there yeah. who want to raise their own points of view. I'm going to go back, though, and get a quick comment from, again, Anne and Ray. No? Okay. In thinking, because since leaving the city, I've worked in a lot of other cities, not as intensively as Larry, more sort of flit in, flit out. But I suddenly realized what I didn't really know when I worked in Vancouver, how lucky we are to work in a city with a charter, which means that the city council can actually enact change. And almost everywhere else I've been working, decisions, even in Ontario, can be appealed to the Ontario Municipal Board. In Auckland, decisions Council can't make the final decision. It goes to Wellington, the capital. Just fancy sending all our city council plans to Ottawa or to Victoria for approval. So what I would say to the director is, you have the ability to do in Vancouver things that other cities can't do because it is in the control of the city in conjunction with the region. Great opportunity, which doesn't occur in many parts of the world. Before we go, I, I want to use this opportunity to say that my recommendation to the mayor would be to put pressure as much as you can as a leader of the community to get more coverage in all media possible, particularly those that reach the most people, in order to have a conversation that is possible because people have a common understanding of the issues. I raise that because I neglected to note that Francis Biola was part of the city conversation. I know I've seen Karen Krangle here from Novus Res Service. Anybody else? Any other blogger, mainstream media, reporter, electronic,
print anybody? We'll find out when we look at our <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> no, I, I can be pretty confident that they're not here. They can't afford to or they no longer have an interest in covering this. Now, I say that with a certain amount of self-interest, obviously. But I've noticed even from the time that I've lived in this city that the possibility of having a common conversation because people have somewhere to go to at least have a common read or a common understanding of the facts has evaporated. It makes it very difficult when social media uh, particularly drive agendas in the way that they do. And that, I think, remains a singular problem. We can't have that conversation if people don't have at least a common set of understandings. So, here first. Thank you. Um, I guess that's a great segue for me in terms of what happens after this evening. So we have a great conversation. We um, walk away from here with no outcome that's transmitted to the city council. So I've got a suggestion. Um, with your advice and your comment, and perhaps the audience, there are a lot of professionals in the audience, uh, that we come up with some kind of statement or uh, message for the City Council. And I'd like to make a suggestion that perhaps we could talk about the public interest. It's a phrase that um, planners speak of with radish, but hasn't been mentioned once. So what about the public interest and how is it protected? How do we retain the autonomy of the director of planning? What is the message for City Hall? Why are we even talking about a manager who is to implement as opposed to a director who is to give direction and vision? So maybe there's something here that we could send as a strong message as an outcome for this meeting other than yada, 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 that we would like to see autonomy for the director of planning who reports directly to the mayor of council. Could you comment, please? Well, I have to say that I always felt it was better when the director of planning had at least the right to speak directly to council, even if the city manager didn't like it. And I know that uh, in Ray's day, you had that right. And it was a very important right because it meant that you could give your best advice. They didn't like it, they didn't like it. You could uh, articulate something that other people could cluster around. You could work with a lot of people and bring a collective message forward. So I think that was a good thing. I don't know if we're all ready to write some sort of manifesto to send to the city council about the chief planner. Um, but I, I do believe that the uh, ability of the planner to be able to speak her or his mind honestly, directly, uh, uh, is important. I actually think it's more important out in the community rather than just at the city council. Just check, the Vancouver City Planning Commission will be sending a report based upon what they've heard and additional information to city council as part of their mandate. That seems to me to be a pretty reasonable thing to do in the way that you've articulated. I'd just say that all of us have, have used the word or, or, or similar words to the word culture. And I personally have never gotten all that fussed about the title. I like the term chief planner. You know, Jen in, in Toronto is called a GM too, but her main title is chief planner. And that's the shorthand we all used anyway. And, uh, so you can call it tuna fish for all I care. What's important is the culture of, 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 of uh, how planning uh, is positioned within City Hall. Okay, we're going to ask a few more people to come forward just before they do. Uh, Ray raised this question. I wonder, does the city really matter as much as it did? I think the answer to that is self-evident when you look at the region. But can the city be the leader of the region in a way that it assumed it could and did in the past? Um, I think it's inappropriate for it to believe that it has all the knowledge with just the citizens of the no, city. No, no, but that's different from providing the leadership. Uh, any municipality could provide the leadership. Any municipality. I don't see that the city is the core of the region and therefore symbolically the centre and should be showing the best leadership and used to do. Uh, but um, 
even in the, the old days, there was a sense that the city was more important than the <laughs> in the city. And I'm saying that's got to change because uh, yeah. we've got to support the region. Yeah, Larry? I'm, I believe that the next generation, the young planners that are just in this room who are just learning, that the focus won't be on the city of Vancouver as much as it's been in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, in a way, our generation fought the battle of the dying city, core city, and we sort of won the battle <laughs> in a way. But what's out there now is where 60% of Canadians live is out in those suburbs, those suburban communities. And the great invention of, to transform the city to be sustainable and livable is actually going to happen out there. So what I'm hoping is that you will see uh, spontaneous fires of creativity out there in the suburban setting to challenge most of the ways those suburbs have been put together. I would like to see them have the kind of charter that we enjoy because Anne is right. It allowed us to do many things in Vancouver that you couldn't do anywhere else. And that kind of, you know, motivated us. But uh, even in the absence of that, there's nothing better than a good idea and a strong constituency around it. And I think that we're going to see that uh, with the new generation because their dedication to the green city is important. But also most of them really are suburbanites. And they've got to take the green agenda to the suburbs, and they've got to transform those suburbs. And frankly, if they don't do that, we're all in trouble. Uh, the core cities are, you know, we, we're just polishing the diamond, as it were. There is one other real trouble that I'm seeing. I've actually been doing some work in some smaller communities in BC and been shocked by comments that, by staff that we can't, by law, talk to council if we have more than two or three councillors in the room. It's deemed a council meeting. And I saw that in the newspaper recently oh gosh, with yes. some discussion. I've got to say that certainly while we were directors, I must have sat down with council once or you know, every couple of weeks talking about whatever the major project was that was underway, sort of sharing, growing, learning together. And I see a real problem coming up for planning if, indeed, all discussion has to take place just in the council chamber and there can't be that growing and sharing. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I have to say, absolutely share that with you. If the American Sunshine Law is assumed to be relevant or required, and we've, I can't think of a better re recipe for very quick dysfunction. I don't see any federal or provincial governments who don't talk to their staff. They do it all in private. This gentleman's been trying to talk. Yeah, yeah I know. Can I just say that's, quickly, that's why I, I've had a... I'm asking you to move along quickly. I, play, I played a role in the new regional plan, and I'd say that any chief planner of Vancouver and any mayor of Vancouver can play a leadership role, but it has to be done in a, in a very careful, respectful way. Because if you go out and say, I'm, yeah. I'm from Vancouver and I know best, you're, you're, you're it's another bloodbath. I back. believe toast is the word, yeah. Mm. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I've heard it been said on a couple of occasions that uh, cities in Canada can't make the changes they need to make because they don't get the percentage of the tax dollar that they should get. And so, uh, you know, it reminds me of things that happen, say, in Vancouver, such as having to leverage various developments for amenities because they can't be afforded in other, say, what might have historically been uh, standard methods. So my question would be, more importantly than getting the right person as the director of planning, is it more important, or as important even, uh, to perhaps look at the latest federal election and look at opportunities with working differently with the federal government to make change in cities the way we want. Lots there. Yeah. I would yes. definitely agree with that. Some of the most successful work that certainly I did in the early years with council was when CMHC, the national government, was providing funds for co-ops and nonprofit housing. In this country, we have never address the issue of the balance between responsibility and resources. More and more responsibilities either get turned down or get picked up, and at the same time, the resources aren't being redirected. I'm not sure I see an opportunity, but I certainly think the new director needs to understand urban economics, finances, and what it might take to get a better balance between responsibility and resources. I think, though, your idea that one is more important than the other is where, where I have a difficulty. 
I agree with everything that's, that that uh, Anna said, but I got to tell you this: in America, uh, <coughs> cities get eight times what Canadian cities get out of the federal government, mm. and they waste it because they don't have leadership in those cities, and they're spending it on more freeways and a bunch of junk. They give ten or twelve million to every new building that comes up to kind of motivate them to build the buildings. There's a lot of wastage. It's not about just more money. It's about spending it on the right things and doing the right things. And I think that's where your chief planner becomes an agent for a community to determine what's right. So I think it's equally important. It, the best thing is when you have a great chief planner, a great planning organization, a wonderful community, and a lot of dough. <laughs> that's a good thing. But don't wait. Don't hold your breath. I'm, I'm excited about the federal government change, but the provincial government is still a challenge, and you needn't look past the example of the day after council made an incredibly bold decision on the viaducts. Todd Stone calls a press uh, calls a press conference and says, "Whoa, uh, the 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 sheer dysfunction of that relationship staggers me." Um, and so, uh, work needs to be done. Irresistibly, I, <laughs> I can't help but note. Uh, for the young uns, prepare yourself for Freeway Fight 2.0 as it manifests itself. The province doesn't spend billions of dollars in every direction to build massive roads and bridges up to the borders of Vancouver and then think that they'll stop there. Just a note. Neil. Thank, thank you so much for this. this is wonderful. And I, Thank you, Gord, for all you've done with the city program, for all you've given back to the city, for all that you've done oh. to raise the level of conversation in the city. Thank I, you, I, Neil. I cannot thank you enough. <laughs> um, on that note, uh, I was very fortunate as part of uh, being part of the Vancouver City Planning Commission to be part of that conversation a few weeks ago that, that Penny so thoughtfully brought up. And the, what struck me was how quickly folks from all sorts of backgrounds coalesced on what they identified as values and principles. And the, and the words just resonated. It was so easy. Collaboration, respect for place, respect for environment, respect for economy, inclusiveness, all these things that are such a part of our city. But with the challenge that you faced, and I'm sure the next uh, folks will too, how do you balance between a deep respect for that, those principles, the culture of this place, and the need to move the dial further, to bring in new ideas, new innovation, and challenge our communities and our city? I'd like to just say one thing about that. Don't take 60 people or 100 people or 200 people or 5,000 people or 10,000 people as enough because those are all self-selected people. They're, they're junkies. You're all junkies <laughs> about planning. What we have to reach out is to the people who've never thought about planning. They have their own ideas. And we have to find techniques that work with those people. You know, we found, for example, with people where English was a difficulty in, down in Dallas uh, with the H Hispanic community that we had these design surrettes where we never talked. We just drew stuff and we made images and we talked through our images. We have to reach out to tens of thousands uh, of people. Um, having said that, I'm finding everywhere in the world, and this is what, it, I, I just did this book and, and what we did in our book is that we found amazing examples of where things made it through the horrible processes and still got built and became exemplars to all of us. And I think we have to tag into those a lot more, learn about them, you know, visit them, bring those ideas back, and then transform them to work in our place. Uh, and I think that's a, a good way to move forward. My experience is that most of the people that are within our culture know a lot of the answers for the future city. The problem is the consumers don't agree with us. Can I add at that point that um, one of the ideas in this community for a long time has been something called urbanarium. Has anybody heard of urbanarium? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if you think of what urbanarium is supposed to do and it hasn't done, it's because City Hall hasn't done it and doesn't do it. And that is it has a place where you can go and get information that you can understand, like in a form which is easy to understand, that tells you about what the city's doing, why it's doing it, and how it's doing it, and also assesses what's happening all the time. It's there all the time. It's not one plan, it's not one process. 
It's there all the time. And it grows respect because what it does is try to tell you the truth as far as reasonable people can put it out, including the alternatives that are available. The thing that's wrong with the plan when it becomes a plan is somehow got rid of the fact that it's got to be flexible the very day it's built. So we need a system of being able to find out what is happening in the city without talking to people who are promoting their own single idea, but bringing issues out, bringing what other people think out, informing you about what the community thinks. And we haven't got that. Uh, I agree that what Gordon is doing here is very significant. There's not enough of it, but he keeps building on it, or <coughs> other people build on it too. And that's so important to do. That's more important fact than many of the other techniques we've been talking about. But we haven't got it. We could start at here, though, you see. So those things start and ferment. And I certainly can't forget Michael Alexander of the City Conversation Program. Michael. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for what I, what I think is the most frank conversation, public conversation that I have heard in the eight years that I've uh, been here. I think it validated the idea that we had the politicians at, at City Conversations two, uh, two weeks ago, and we had the former planners, but very much still planners, uh, here tonight. It really opened up uh, the conversation. Thank you for your frankness. Um, I think that Gord was exactly right that when the four of you were working, uh, essentially you were working on the easy parts of the city. Um, there are a few brownfield, greenfields, uh, uh, perhaps left the viaducts, the Jericho lands, maybe little, little mountain. But you could go and talk with every one of the 650,000 people in Vancouver and get every one of them to open up enough to give you what they want, what they think. And you would be still missing a lot of people. And those are the people who want to be here, are coming here eventually, but have no voice here. Who speaks for them? That's a question. That's a nice statement too, thank you. The, the, I think the other important thing is that we've got to think about the people who aren't here can't come because they're not born yet. And this is even more important that we deal with those. And we're not dealing with those because we're concentrating on immediate issues all the time. And so we've got to expand that discussion so we all sense the responsibility of what happens when we do or do not do what we're doing in order to create a future for everybody. Well, when we, when we were trying to have the conversation about change in the rest of the city, the, the, the non-easy parts, uh, a lot of the narrative was about future generations. It was about people who couldn't come. Uh, we were planning for, a, we were talking about a population that didn't exist yet, and we got criticized for that. How dare you um, uh, put on equal footing these people that don't exist yet or aren't here yet, put on equal footing to, the, to those of us who are already in the city. And that's a very tough conversation to have. I firmly have always believed that when you're planning for the future, by definition, that means you're planning, when you're thinking about climate change, you're talking about future generations. When you're thinking about growth, you're talking about future residents and such. And that's the job of the planner to look at all of those. But what I've realized and, and, and is, is it's a tough conversation and can lead to, and if you don't do it artfully and sensitively, you can make a lot of people mad that, that, that local residents uh, are somehow not being respected. There's absolutely a way to do it though. And I, I, I'm, I'm better at it every day, I think. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, it, and it's critically important, but it's sure not easy. Larry? First thing, your idea of what's easy and my idea of what's easy <laughs> seem very different. Because <laughs> it was pretty hard, it's just so you'll know. It was pretty hard, <laughs> but we did do it. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is we should acknowledge you and your leadership this week in doing something very extraordinary, which is getting rid of those damn viaducts. So congratulations on great leadership, Thank Michael, you. and that, along with a lot of other people. What I want to say about this is that in any engagement process, 
you're always going to have the people of the future that you have to find a way to get into the conversation. You're always going to have the outsiders you have to find a way to get in the conversation. And there are many kinds of techniques to use that. I commend you to look at the planning that's going on in Amsterdam right now, where what they're doing is they're reaching out to the, literally to the entire world through the social media to really begin to bring the vision of people who would like to come to Amsterdam in the future, people who, uh, you know, or can talk uh, about uh, uh, educators that can talk about what young people are talking about, that all kinds of people are being brought into that equation. Unfortunately, most of our techniques don't even try that. Most of our techniques are very 19th century, you know, or very 1950s, actually. Yeah. Uh, and most of our techniques get a few people in a room like this and say, yeah, they all agree with us, or they don't agree with us, and that's the end of the story. We have just fabulous techniques we can use now. We're all giving you Twitter, a set then. of stickies to put on the I'm wall. On Twitter, Twitter, yeah. Twitter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just give you a quick example of how we brought people of the future into discussions in communities in Vancouver. Everybody almost now has a cell phone, but everybody has a picture of relatives, children if they're older, um, the newborn baby. It's amazing how in discussions people pass those around and how in those discussions thinking about some of those people um, who are the future brings everybody in the room to thinking about the future. The one that works very well in the room, as Larry says, is the question about how do you engage a much wider group. Auckland did almost all of their new plan using the web. Now, that was great because everybody had equal access to information to the draft plan. It did have a downside. When we looked at who had actually engaged, as I recall, about 60% of the comments were from 11 people who did nothing other than keep writing in. <laughs> and so you do have to watch that your conversation, if you're doing it um, through social media, is indeed reaching a broad group. So you have to do some tests on that, which Auckland did. And that's, I think, uh, an opportunity for future planners, how connected we are. I worry that if the connections, however, aren't at some point face to face. We didn't notice in Auckland that people, people tend to be listening to blogs of people they agreed with. The challenge is to make sure that you're listening to other people and sharing those different directions and sort of debating, arguing about what the choices are that face the city. And that's what we found. I still haven't found a way to get off of face-to-face -face is an adequate way of actually addressing some of, having people change their minds, address those choices. Thank you. Let me add a very brief corollary. When you're planning a neighborhood, the people from the neighborhood come, the people who feel most invested in the neighborhood come. But how does that, but how do the, do the needs of the city get balanced by the need, by what they perceive as the needs of the neighborhood and they stop thinking about being, being citizens of the city? Let me tell you how City Plan did that. City Plan gave some broad directions for the city. <coughs> the neighborhood went and planned, but we had a group called the City Hats or the City Perspectives Panel. They were people from other neighborhoods who participated in your neighborhood planning, but were in a position to say, hey, 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 if you don't take your share, it falls on our neighborhood. That's not fair. So there are ways to engage a broader city perspective in a local discussion. Plus, I believe that's just the planner's role. The planner yeah. listens to thousands of voices every day, not just the voices in their head. Um, and, and balances, but the, the, the part that many planning processes are not good at is they'll listen, they'll, they'll invite a room like you, you'll tell us what you think, and then uh, we may make a decision, and we're not good at explaining to the group who's just said something like this, how the decision was made that balanced not only the voices in this room, but all the other voices, all the other perspectives. We don't show our work like my fourth grade math teacher used to say. We just give the answer. 
And that's, that's pretty bad communication. And, and it leads to people saying, you didn't listen, which is often just code for you didn't do what we told you to do. Thank you. It's been really informative to have such a knowledgeable group together here. Uh, at some point, you've all touched on the importance of public engagement as well as uh, the influence or pressure from council. So what qualities do you think a uh, chief planner and the planning leadership should have in negotiating that tension uh, within the context of significant growth in Vancouver? And on the engagement side, I'd like to add that I'm the fourth person to ask a question and I'm the fourth white man to ask a question. <laughs> Just so, you, just so you know, in most, in most engagement programs that have any credibility, first things, they will be done in multiple languages. They will be done in languages that reflect um, the, the profile of the community that you're in or the, the people that would be interested. Uh, and almost all the work that we do in Dallas, for example, we do things in Spanish and English because that you have to. Uh, second thing is I've never seen a, a public engagement program that wasn't layered with many different techniques and the mm. truth tends to pop out from all of those techniques. It's not just one thing. Unfortunately, a lot of planners have taken public engagement down to the point of being very rote. I have two ways of doing it. If you don't like my way, that's your problem. Thirdly, we don't really design public engagement for the people who are engaging. We design it for our convenience. So we do it at the wrong time. We do it with the wrong arrangements in the wrong setting. We have no supports. The best thing we do is offer a cup of coffee when maybe what we need to offer is childcare. Um, in, in some work we did in, in a very modest income neighborhood in Washington, D.C., we actually paid everyone to come. Everyone who came got paid, just the same we got paid, because you know what? Their, their time was very valuable when they made $6 an hour. So there's many kinds of techniques, but planners, we went through a period where public engagement was very creative, and then we went through a period where I find public engagement got very uncreative. Walking it got around, very looking rote. at some... And in fact, in some cities, the public engagement methods are now institutionalized in laws, mm -hmm. and you can't do anything else. Um, but the beauty of your generation is that you have a way around that. You know, you can do what they did in Egypt, what they've done elsewhere. You can get into social media and you can talk to people regardless of what authorities are saying. And you can find ways to reach people that haven't been reached before. And I think that's magical and it has great potential. You raised an interesting point just at the time I was thinking about it. Um, and you got two more white guys behind you. <laughs> what should we do? But one is older. Well, yeah, but what should we do? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't look I that think old. we should just let people speak. <laughs> well, uh, we could ask, uh, have a 50-50 balance. Is it too much to ask? Surely someone else? Let everyone talk the way they wish. Let's not make it the way we want it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we'll see what kind of activity there was on Twitter afterwards. Yeah. Uh, as a facilitator, you see, you try, you make an effort to do something, and you get blowback. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it works. Uh, yeah, the old white guy. <laughs> you're the youngest. You don't look that old to me, to be honest. Oh, you're very kind. Um, <laughs> And I'm probably the one that's not eligible to be here because I actually am not from here. I work in the mayor's office in, in Coquitlam. And who might you be, actually? And um, That's why I have the nerve to say <laughs> <laughs> He's my mayor. And one of my constituents is one of your panelists. Yes. Um, but I, I, do, I do actually, Coquitlam are probably the residents who think the viaducts were built for them. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, we're... I guess I'm really wondering, and I really appreciate Mr. Spaxman's acknowledgement that uh, people in public life are, are people too. Um, how do we, what do, what do we do when, um, we know what happens when, when the planners are perceived to be wrong, council votes them down. Uh, what happens when the politicians are wrong? Um, because that happens too. Um, but also, what do we do with the region? What do we do with the rest of, with some acknowledgement that the rest of the region is where a lot of this is going to take place. 
Uh, Coquitlam is burgeoning, Surrey is burgeoning, the center of gravity for development is moving eastward, and, and how does Vancouver's choice of a planner uh, matter? The, the only thing I think the planner has to be is uh, he recognizes the importance of the region. And he has to bring that forward. Uh, at the same time, I think everybody's beginning to recognize more what's happening in the region. And we'll give the, I know the new regional planners there, and I've met with the regional planners to talk about this very thing. They are very keen and interested in beginning to lead at the regional level as well. And they have, like, these questions come up for them that they're trying to do with now. Is our responsibility as planners more to the council that runs the region, or is it to the people of the region? Which is an interesting dilemma. Uh, but nevertheless, they are considering also, what do we do about globalization as it affects this region? What do we do? Because this has been the focus of my question to them is, how can you allocate densities uh, of people to different parts of this region? And then find the region, have the individual communities have their own opinion about that and vary what you say. And how do you bring forward the debate at the regional level about the impact of putting a population in the wrong place or not knowing what impact the density that you propose for somebody might have having a built form? So, what we get into is the complexity there is for a planner to be able to see the detail, to see the generality, to see the problem socially politically and behave as adroitly as he possibly can or she possibly can with the council or the region that they're dealing with. And it's, it's not a process that you solve overnight, but what you do is you hang on to the, the shifts of the term occurring. And I think there are shifts occurring in this community at the regional level and the local level, particularly at the local level, which if um, expressed as well as people can make it, and then join in it will affect and change the way government operates. I also think that, that a strong, um, articulate planner, no matter where they're working, if they're providing leadership, should be talking about the implications at all levels, the neighborhood level, their city level, the regional level, some other city in the region's level. You may not be able to take a recommendation to another council, but you can speak in public about it. You can inspire other people to think about it, worry about it. You can form informal liaisons and combinations of people to attack certain kinds of issues. Um, and I think through that, you can start to make some progress. You can find allies who feel the same way. I feel, for example, that that's one of the big things we need to do for affordable housing right now. Uh, there's, a, there's been an inclination historically to say the affordable housing has to kind of be handled by the core city because that's where the poor people tend to be. But, you know, that's changing in our, in our region. And we need a kind of a, 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 a collaboration or a collegium of answers. I think every planner can talk about the various levels and then they'll act where they have the authority to act. And otherwise, it's the authority of influence. And I would say that I'm already seeing a lot more leadership from other communities when the last um, iteration of the regional growth strategy happened, it was your municipality, Nurse Stewart, who actually stood up and said, some of these ways this is going to be managed don't work and challenged the region and had that, I think, very fruitful discussion which improved everybody's understanding of how the new regional plan would work. So, Presently, Greg Moore chairing the region. I see a lot more happening in the suburban areas, and I think Vancouver, you know, maybe other than the transit referendum where there's a bit of discussion, has stepped back a bit. And so I think a lot's happening in the region that once you've got the evergreen line, everybody else will be able to go and see. <laughs> I, uh, I think that who the chief planner of Vancouver is matters less than it used to, but it still matters. And from my perspective, I always uh, embrace, as Larry said, the, the, the power of, of, of inspiration and, and help. And when, when we did something in the center city, I always felt that it in some way was making it an easier task for the suburbs to, to take it on if they wanted to as they urbanize, whether it's issues like secondary suites as of right or, or, or laneway housing or, or just density around transit or what have you. Um, the power of inspiration or for paving the way, we always tried to document our packages, our, our approaches 
so that if a mayor of one municipality who frequently did, mayors would call us up and say, we're thinking about that, we send all our information out there and we try to be helpful. I'd say more and more uh, the opposite potential is there. I was the consultant for um, uh, New Westminster on the, the housing policy for families and the new policy is 20% uh, uh, two-bedroom and 10% three-bedroom. Uh, which is, no, 25% and 10%, so 35%, which is more ambitious than Vancouver's. And very quickly, uh, the mayor uh, announced that he wanted to raise it in Vancouver. So we, uh, we actually talked in New Westminster about being an inspiration to the other, not only regional municipalities, but the center city as well, on, on who could have the most progressive policy around housing for families. So I think that inspiration can go in every direction. Yeah. Thanks, Mayor Stewart. Appreciate that. Uh, any other civic politicians or politicians at any level here? Well, again, thanks for coming, making that effort. Oh, and who are you? Uh, Matt oh, hey, Matt. <laughs> Good to see you. And North Vancouver District, yeah? Yes, right. I'm curious about the urban design aspect of this, the city planning job and what the uh, future need and capacity of the city of Vancouver um, is. Good question. Uh, well, maybe I'll start. From a, there's, I've always felt that there was always a very strong urban design ethic, and you didn't need a division called urban design, which they now have. What mattered was that there was a culture, that planning and urban design were one thing, and that many exercises that we do, whether it's uh, community amenity contributions or, or anything, always started with a design first kind of approach. And uh, folks like Scott Hine, uh, formerly the urban designer, have, have, have been quite candid about the fear that some of that's been lost. I know that on the part of staff, it hasn't been lost. The staff of the, the planning department and, and other departments as well that, that uh, planning works with still strongly believes uh, in an, an urban design uh, is, a, is a bedrock of, of, of successful city making kind of approach. I think. Um, some of that's been lost in the disconnect with what the city management office has valued or even sometimes the politicians. But um, I think if we can, our new chief planner has to have an urban design uh, ethic, an, earth, an urban design perspective, the ability to know good urban design when they see it and, 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 um, and the alternative as well. Uh, I think that's a core con uh, component of the successful work. Rick. Urban design is uh, essential for any urban development at all, knowledge of urban design. And the knowledge of urban design is not just insisting that it happens, but actually forming it up in a way that people can understand why it's important. The, the old mantra of commodity firmness and delight, which I bore people with all the time, is it's got to work, it's got to be affordable, it's got to be comfortable, and it's got to be beautiful. Now in that, the city has a role not to design everything, but to make sure that anybody who brings anything to bear on the city is neighborly. You've all heard me talk about neighborliness before, that without neighborliness, this city, any city cannot work. And when it comes to neighborliness, it's both all the things we've been talking about, about process, but it's also about how do you design a building? And I've been affronted recently by the number of people who can come into City Hall and slap a high rise in front of somebody else and not only put a thin one up, but to put the thickest one up they can find, right in front of somebody who a few years ago thought they had a view. And that's being destroyed literally all the time now in this city because there's an absence of the idea of neighborliness, and urban design is the root of good neighborliness. I, I was very naive on this topic because I thought all cities had an urban design ethic, as you call it, until I went to some other cities and realized they have no urban design ethic at all. While I believe that planning is inherently about three-dimensionality, four-dimensionality, it's not just about land use and transportation. It is about uh, urban design. And in fact, I discovered that the way that you can make planning work for people, given that we're all private in, in our private lives are consumers and we want good products and, and urban design brings that, uh, is to raise the bar of it all the time. Then when I went to other cities and found it wasn't going on and s s no one seemed to even care about it and no one even cared about the results very much, it was pretty frightening for me. Even though we've had some dramas recently and Scott is one of my I, 
people I admire the most, uh, we still have a very high urban design culture here as compared to other cities. What we have to do is take care of it. Uh, we have to honor it. We have to uh, support it. Uh, and, make, and you as, as citizens have to demand it. Let me add a conundrum to this. I heard it in Dallas at the Revolution Conference, and you hear it more and more here. The fear of the better, the fear of good urban design, the improvements, the amenity. You provide that, that better transit service. You provide bike share. You put in that park. You actually make my neighborhood better. You gentrify it. You attract those who will drive up the rents. The new will make my existing accommodation more affordable. I'm right on the edge now. Stay away. Well, I've always taken the view, and I've had this conversation a hundred times here in Vancouver, that the, t the terrible is still worse than the good, even though the good might have the tendency to rule some people out. In fact, what you have to do if, you, if you're aspiring to the good is have a much more strategic program to rule those people back in. And that's what we've forgotten. It's not that that it's good urban design that has killed our, our social diversity. It's that a lot more people want to come here and we have no programs to help to accommodate all kinds of people. We don't do almost anything to accommodate middle income people and support middle income people. We barely support low income people. So, and, and all the other kinds of issues, we don't do very much. And all around the world, people are doing a lot more than us on this. So you don't have to say either get good and cheap, I mean, good and expensive, or terrible and cheap. Well, gee, I'd rather have terrible and cheap. Do you want to live in a slum? And I can tell you the people who are living in those slums don't want to live in those slums. And I think everybody on this panel, the design principles that lead to successful urban design do not have to, nor should they even be more expensive. Exactly. That's one of those classic false choices that comes up in these debates about better city making because um, good design should in, almost be less expensive by definition if it's, it's good design. It's usually about how relationships happen, certainly not less so about the cost of materials and things like that. I will say if there are any younger people here who are just starting their career and you're not, you don't have a good urban design sort of sense in your head, don't totally give up hope. You either partner with somebody who has it, <laughs> or you make sure, knowing that that's not your strength, that you have a deputy whose strength it is. Because I've got to tell you, if my husband heard me talking, us talking about this, he would be laughing, rolling on the floor laughing, because I have no aesthetic design at all. And Larry, you want to see Larry go white? That's when there's a development permit board meeting and Larry's on holiday and he thinks, shit, what'll, that's that planning word again. What'll happen if Anne has to sit in my seat <laughs> on the urban design panel? He tried so hard to never be on holidays when the urban design panel met. So don't give up if you're not. She's building for effect. <laughs> don't give up if you're not. You see where the code came from and co-director. Hi. I think it would be a really big loss for people of Vancouver not to hear from this, you know, not hearing and getting exposure to this. So I really hope uh, this does get exposure. I think this, thank you so much for bringing this together. I mean, one needs to read the headlines tomorrow and probably see what was more important not having something from this. But hopefully it will get the exposure it deserves. I have, uh, as the last person here standing, so I have uh, one comment, one question, one public announcement. <laughs> But good. Um, maybe I'll do the pu public announcement first about the Urbanarium. That is, as you are, very. it's working and it's going to be uh, having a relaunch, hopefully very soon, with the help of people on the panel, Scott Hyde and uh, Leslie and other people around and yourself, I think. Um, so that was the public announcement. Oh, but the where? date, I can't, I can't say, but it will be hopefully soon. How, How will we find out if we want to? Um, website, Urbanarium. Urbanarium.com. CA? It might be .ca, but I think it's .com, actually. Just put Urbanarium. Just put Urbanarium. Google knows it's all. It's .com. But Urbanarium, just you search Urbanarium and you get... Uh, Great. Yeah, we've, we've had uh, one event, but it will be, I'm sure we're going to be more active and have a relaunch. So that was a public announcement. Thank you. Um, the comment was... Um, 
So I, I was sitting there and I just realized I had the opportunity to work at the city at a time that uh, all of you, so I worked at the city from 2005 to 2004, 2014 on and off. So I had the opportunity to work actually at development services and when it became planning and development services under the new uh, manager of two. So I actually have worked under you at one time or the other. And also I had Ray as a client at some point. So it's very interesting. I was sitting here, I'm like, Ooh, I just, just clicked. And I realized the mood at City Hall and this has, might have to do a lot with why maybe there's not enough interest now from the media tonight. What I was thinking, maybe, maybe that is the reason that you don't see enough interest in this hall from media, is because how the mood at City Hall has changed in, in the planning department, particularly for the last two or three years. Um, I'm not at City Hall anymore, so, um, but I was full-time, then I went back to school, so part-time I had the uh, opportunity to go back and check in every summer. So, but I realized how the mood has changed. And I think that has to do something, has something to do with how the, there is no, or not enough uh, media attention. You know, not enough interest maybe. And, uh, and I think partly it comes from the comment that Brandy made, maybe there's not enough trust or trust has been broken between the city and uh, people, citizens. So the question I have to moving forward and on a more optimistic note is if you assume we're going to get that uh, um, strong character, you know, that person um, on the chair and become as a city planner and hopefully as a director of planning and not just the manager of development services, um, what do you think after listening and learning, what do you think the first big move should be that the new director of planning should make? Thank you. And that sounds like an actually pretty good question to end with. So we're going to ask you to answer that and to make any other final comments you'd like to add as well. Well, I'll start and end first. Um, I think the new planner working with the whole planning department team, by the way, these are some of the smartest people on the planet as planners. Uh, I think the new planner has to take forward to council a very uh, progressive, proactive agenda of planning. Right now, most, I don't think most citizens even know what the planning department is doing or care what the planning department is doing. And it's because, you know, we used to go every year and do an evaluation and we used to tell them what we're going to do the next year and everyone would get very excited and they'd all argue about it and then we'd agree and off we'd go and do it. I think the new planner has to say uh, with his, her or his team, here's what we would like to do for planning in Vancouver over the next year or five years. Uh, we want to go and get political embracement, endorsement of that, and then we want to move forward to do it. And yeah, we'll figure out how to do the money and all of that, but let's start with a, just a strong sense that we've got to fix the planning malaise that is underway right now. And that will come by that planner putting that for, strong for, uh, uh, program forward. And then second, as I've said before, and I'll say it again, and I hope you'll only remember it, which is the new planner does have to go and talk to Vancouver. Wait, I agree with Larry. Yeah, I agree with Larry. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Larry. <laughs> well, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I could tell this was going to be a pretty extraordinary evening just because of the engaged conversation that you were holding. I mean, literally conversation. And, and I've been at this game long enough to know when I can hear or see the interest and the intensity, and I could certainly feel it in this room tonight, it was, I think, a reflection of the frankness and the honesty and the insight that you all provided. That was extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you very much, not only for that, but all the service that you've given to this city that you so love. I appreciate it. So carry on, carry on, <laughs> converse among yourselves. <laughs>